Let's treasure hunt. What's I that mean, green stuff on the sand? Mom, me and Mom both know we're working on this one. Yeah. Before we left. Oh. Hey, I'm right here. Hey, I'm trying to uncover this. Server. 
inside of the box for us. And down here at the bottom, we have water atomizers. Water atomizers take water and they turn it into a mist or fog-like effect. They're typically used in things like ponds or water features. All of this together is going to work to give us an example of an, a tornado in captivity. So, as soon as we flip that switch on, our fan will kick up, and this will begin to create some movement inside of the box itself. And now we see our tornado. Now, you may have also noticed that we have these gaps cut into the box. This is to allow airflow from outside to inside, because what we're using to create our tornado here is Bernoulli's principle. We're using a difference in air pressure. Bernoulli's principle states that the faster moving fluid has less pressure. The fluid in question here is not only the, the water molecules from the atomizers, making it visible, but more specifically, the air. The air around us is considered a fluid. So as the fan up top starts to spin the air inside, the air in the center of that vortex is moving faster than the air outside of it. So that is a faster moving fluid with less pressure. So the center is our low pressure system. Outside of that is our high pressure system pushing in towards the center. All of this works together and gives us this repeated uh, sort of process creating our version of a tornado. Now you may have also noticed, it's not that strong. It's a very weak tornado. Tornadoes in captivity, not that strong. However, tornadoes out in the wild, incredibly strong. Tornadoes out in the wild can spin up to 300 miles per hour. The uh, top of the funnel can be up to five miles wide. The bottom of the funnel can be up to two miles wide. In fact, the widest tornado recorded touching down was two miles wide here in Oklahoma. Now, in order to get a tornado out in the wild, you need to start with something called a supercell storm. Supercell storms are a bit different than your average thunderstorm because they have something in them that tornadoes need. They have a spinning vortex of air already in the middle. As it spins, it starts to kick warm air up, cool air down. If that happens enough, it will actually begin to tilt. This will speed up the process, causing that funnel to spin faster and faster, and that can actually cause it to elongate. Once it elongates and touches down to the ground, that is when we consider it to be a tornado. So of course, this is the part of the show where I have to say, if you hear those tornado sirens kick on, please, please, please get to either a tornado shelter or a central room in your house with no windows, something like a bathroom or a large closet. Please do not stand on your front porch and record it while sipping sweet tea. <laughs> Oklahomans, I've met you. Y'all did that last week, didn't you? Got weirdly quiet. I'm sensing shenanigans. All right. One more round of applause for Wendy, everybody. Liquid nitrogen is negative 320.4 degrees Fahrenheit. It is incredibly cold. It is nitrogen gas that has been cooled, compressed, and condensed down to that temperature until it becomes a liquid. Now, when that happens, we have to keep it in special containers like this. This is called a dewer. This dewer can hold up to about 30 pounds of liquid nitrogen at a time, just a fun fact for you. And this is what liquid nitrogen looks like. It can be a little difficult to see. But more importantly, do we all see the cloud that's already coming off of this? That cloud right there? That cloud shows us liquid nitrogen expanding back into gaseous nitrogen, like that. It happens instantaneously, because liquid nitrogen's boiling point is the same as its liquefying point. That means any time liquid nitrogen comes into contact with something room temperature to us, that's over 400 degrees warmer than liquid nitrogen. It's going to flash boil. Now that flash boiling can actually look pretty cool. It can create something called the lead and frost effect, the light and frost effect, which looks like this. If you've ever had a hot pan in the stove and you pour water on that pan, you may have noticed the water beat up and skid around. It's the same effect that's happening. What's going on is the liquid is boiling so quickly that it's not actually touching the ground. Instead, it's rolling on a pocket of its own expanding gas, keeping it hovering just above the surface of the stage here. So we're gonna use that incredibly low boiling point and expansion rate to help produce our cloud. So of course, as I mentioned, we already have a cloud that comes off of this, but as you may have noticed, it's pretty wispy. It's not very full, it disappears really quickly. Now I can't get a cloud to hang out for too long, but I can get it to be a lot more visible, for sure. There we go. You need a pretty specific amount of liquid nitrogen for this, but you don't need just liquid nitrogen. In order to make this more voluminous, more visible to everybody, we need to add moisture. 
And the best way to do that is to literally use water. So back here behind the desk, I currently have an electric tea kettle bringing water up to its boiling point. Does anybody know the boiling point of water in Fahrenheit? You can just shout it out. Yeah, 200 degrees Fahrenheit, absolutely correct. Uh, if we're talking Celsius, it would be a lot easier to use 100 degrees Celsius, but we're in America, we use Fahrenheit. So, we're gonna get an equal amount of water to our liquid nitrogen. Just a little bit more. Fun fact, clear liquids are hard to measure in white cups. You can't see them, they disappear. All right, now I'm gonna mix these two liquids together into this empty cup right here, and we're just gonna see what happens. Bless you. All right, now, from the audience, I do need a little bit of help. I need you guys to give me a countdown, starting from three. Go ahead. Three, two, one. Yeah. 
to be a bear. Thank you for knowing me, bear. There we go, a bear. Can I paint it? I don't... I want to fill this entire thing with blue. Okay. How do we fill it with energy? Take that all, take that baby up, hold it way high. Is this, is this? You already red? have blue, it's now you select light. the red. Uh, is there like normal red? Which? I'm real. You know what? I wanna try ya. Uh, what would, what would a bear look like? Should we go for brown, a white, or something? Wait, this thing's already white. <laughs> Which one? I don't know. There's a color called periwinkle. Wait, I wanna try ya. Uh, this one, purple heart, purple. I'm keeping that. I'm coloring this baby purple. 
No, I'm gonna color this entire page purple. color this in no started it over or did you send wait. it that way you sent wait. it that oh, way oh, oh. <laughs> so there. look it's eating it's eating look you can see it's eating Watch out, there's some creepy critters over here. Starfish. Look, this one's eating too. This one's eating. You can see it's chewing. It's chewing too, see? See its eye. Wait, the hole in the middle is it? Ooh! Mission accomplished. Go to Ning Chai Wan Rescue Team because it gets back to the Science Museum of Oklahoma. 